My name is Mohammed Sultan Yaha. I am currently the past chair of Topical Group on Data Science, uh, and I was the uh, program chair for March meeting 2020. Uh, as we all know, the uh, March meeting got canceled uh, this year, and uh, we thought this would be an opportunity to move uh, online and present at least uh, some of the invited talks and some of the contributed talks, and uh, as well as our short course and uh, tutorial uh, online. And we are so glad to uh, have you join us. And uh, please uh, stay tuned. We are going to uh, keep you informed about our uh, upcoming webinars. Uh, we have another webinar uh, scheduled for next week. You'll hear uh, from us. Um, and uh, if uh, you are among the people who didn't get to uh, give the talk, like most of us, uh, and you're uh, interested and your talk is related to data science, please feel free to reach out and maybe uh, you could uh, fit your talk within uh, one of the GDS talks after you're uh, finished with the uh, March meeting, uh, specified GDS March meeting talks. Um, I also have here uh, my colleague, uh, Jay Ren. Jay is currently, uh, she's the new chair of uh, GDS. Uh, Jay, do you want to say a few words? Hey everyone, um, can you hear me okay, Mohammed? Yes. Just the soundtrack, thank you. Um, yeah, this is our uh, first uh, webinar for, for our uh, GDS FEM webinar series. And uh, if you have been following uh, our topical group on data science with the American Physical Society, uh, we are actually trying to uh, start a whole list of activities, uh, starting with this web webinar, we will have uh, online work, sh online uh, short courses. We will also uh, try to uh, start off some uh, career discussion and data science uh, kind of tutorials. And uh, please stay tuned and please feel free to join us. Um, we are online in Twitter, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, please find us. And uh, if you have any thoughts, any suggestions, please let us know. And yeah, you can find us by the uh, handle APS Data Science uh, in all of these platforms. Um, just very briefly, I wanted to uh, tell you about our mission statement, uh, why we are here. Uh, as we all know, data science is a very hot and practical topic at the moment, and uh, for all the good reasons. Uh, and we thought in 2018, uh, we thought that this would be uh, very appropriate for APS to have a separate data science uh, unit, uh, you know, allocated for machine learning and data science research as well as education. And this was something that was missing in uh, pretty much very close to 100% of units were involved uh, in this area, in this topic, but it didn't have a home. So that was the main motivation. And um, at the executive committee, uh, we have uh, identified uh, sorry, what happened? We have identified areas that we uh, thought are uh, most important, including uh, research and education. Uh, so, if you're a faculty, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're a faculty and you would like to uh, uh, bring data science tools to your classrooms and uh, basically help uh, your students research or their future uh, career. Uh, we are here to help, and that's one of our uh, motivations. If you're a researcher, you would like to share uh, your work. Uh, we are here uh, to create that platform, bring uh, physicists from uh, different disciplines uh, together, because uh, oftentimes the techniques are uh, the same, uh, but the uh, topic is different. But you know, we can discuss the techniques together, even uh, you know, from astronomy to material science to uh, condensed matter, uh, we are all using the same technique. So uh, that is the motivation behind uh, GTS. All right, so uh, with that, maybe uh, we can move a uh, very brief introduction about the speakers and then uh, we'll introduce them uh, when each speaker is up. So we will have uh, Pat Riley from Google. He'll talk about machine learning for seeing and hearing more. Um, this was a part of the invited session uh, that we had with FIAP, uh, this talk, as well as uh, Brahma's talk. Rama uh, Vasudevan, uh, he's from uh, Oak Ridge National Lab, and he'll talk about machine learning scanning probe microscopy. 
uh, again, this talk was a part of uh, the, the uh, co-sponsored session with FIAP. And uh, Sarah Stone, uh, who is an executive director uh, of the eScience Institute at uh, University of Washington. Uh, Sarah uh, has been on the education side and uh, like myself, and she will be talking about university-wide uh, approach to integ uh, integrative data science education and career paths. So we have a very ex uh, exciting uh, panel and uh, for, uh, I, I will let Jay talk about the upcoming webinars and uh, introduce uh, Patrick Riley. Yeah, so um, after this uh, after this webinar today, we will uh, plan to have a series of follow-on webinars uh, highlighting a lot of the invited talks that we have planned for the uh, Physics March meeting. Uh, the immediate upcoming ones we have, we will feature uh, Devin Silva from Michigan State University and also Dr. Hendrik Kamang uh, from IBM. Uh, so please stay tuned. And then uh, in addition, we will also be featuring our uh, GDS short course and uh, please also stay tuned to that. We will also be sending you uh, the information, the registration uh, links to those uh, webinars and short course events uh, after this meeting. So uh, please stay tuned and please uh, feel free to register and let us know your thoughts. Um, and with that, I will um, give a brief introduction to Dr. Patrick Riley, uh, who is our first invited speaker of this session today. Um, Patrick Riley is a principal engineer and senior researcher of the Google Accelerated Science team at Google Research. His team collaborates with external scientists to apply Google's knowledge and experience in machine learning and data science to, imp to important problems in the natural, science, natural sciences. Um, his work includes applications in drug discovery, quantum chemistry, material science, and nuclear fusion. Um, Patrick got his PhD from Carnegie Mellon University studying artificial intelligence in multi-agent systems. Before Google accelerated science, he spent the first part of his 14 years at Google in web search, uh, where he developed search features and led efforts on search logs collection and analysis of user behavior. So that is a pretty rich and um, definitely uh, awesome uh, kind of tenure that, that Patrick <laughs> has uh, so, um, yeah, so with that, I will turn to Patrick. Sorry, Patrick, before you start, I just want to mention uh, very briefly, if you guys have any questions, please feel free uh, to uh, write down the questions in the question section of the GoToWebinar. Uh, we will have six minutes uh, to get to the questions. If you want to ask your question verbally, uh, you should feel free to raise your hand and we can unmute you so you can ask your question directly. Uh, this talk is being recorded, so if you have to miss uh, some parts of it, uh, we will send you a link to the record, recorded file. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, take, it up, take it away, Patrick. Great, thank, thank you, everybody. Let me uh, start the presentation here. I wanna thank the organizers for, uh, for making this possible and for everyone joining. I hope we are uh, successful in, uh, in, the, the, in the first technical trial of, of getting this all to work. Um, so as uh, as, as, the, uh, as as Jay said, uh, I'm a, a re I'm a lead researcher for this group, Google Accelerated Science, and we spend a lot of time working with all kinds of natural scientists uh, to see what kind of things we can do together, uh, and and that would be difficult to do if we didn't uh, if we didn't work together. And so um, we've done a whole lot of different projects over the five or so years that we've that we've been around. And if you're interested in the types of things we've done, you know, please check uh, please check out our website where you can see references to everything I'm going to talk about today as well as a whole bunch of other fun stuff. So my goal today is I'm going to go through a bunch of uh, 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 particular examples of how we've used machine learning to really uh, perceive the world um, and allow us to, to see things or hear things that, we, that would otherwise be difficult to do it, especially at the scales that we want to do them. And so the first example I want to talk about, um, we've typically called seeing more. And the context for this is um, uh, this technique that showed up uh, from the machine learning world a few years back to do what's commonly called image to image regression. And one of the, the classic examples of this are to take a natural uh, scene picture like you see over here on the left 
and then you and then to get the true depth of that. So we know the walls are further back, the desk is closer, and then we try to get uh, we try to build a machine learning model that is able to predict that depth image from this input image. And as you can see over here on the right, these machine learning models can do a decent job. This is because they learn something about the natural world and the types of things that are typically seen, that they're, they're in the same way that you and I can infer the depth of the scene, these models can. Now, if you're wondering why you know, people actually want to do this, well, the thing that you've probably seen are actually the applications of this on portrait data. So here, if you're taking, you know, if you're taking the selfies, we, the, these algorithms will figure out what part of the selfie is the foreground, and that allows you to do all these great effects like desaturate the background or defocus and make all of your selfies look better. Now, well, that's a, a, a noble thing to do. Uh, we, were, we, we said, well, these are, these are really interesting techniques. Let's see where else we can apply them. And so the, the task we're looking at um, is looking at um, uh, images of cells growing in dishes. So if you're not familiar with this kind of thing, it's very common in biological research to grow up cells in, in, in little tiny wells. And most often, uh, biologists will look at images like you see, over, you see over here on the right, where you have all these sort of brightly colored. And the way this is done is by putting in these fluorescent stains that bind to particular proteins in these cells. And these are, these are you know, it, it highlight the things you want to see and are, are relatively easy to, am, to, to analyze. But the image over here on the left, this is actually the type of, a type of image just using, um, just using light um, that is actually much easier to take. It requires less perturbing of the cells. You can do it while they're alive very, very easily. And as you can see in this image, there really do seem to be, you know, relationships between this bright field image and this kind of, and this fluorescent imagery. And so this looks exactly like this image to image regression problem we were just talking about, which is, can we use this simpler grayscale, you know, sort of light field imagery over here on the left to predict this image over here on the right? And so I'm not going to give you all the gory details of how of how it's done, but let me show you what it actually looks like. So this is a close up of some a very similar image to what you were just seeing, and you can see these kind of you know these little bumps that that look like cells, and these and these things that um, uh, that that are the the processes of these neurons. So these are these are neurons uh, from from rats. So the here is the the light field image. This is the image that the model was trying to predict. This is the truth if you had fixed and stained these things. And then this is the image that um, the model predicted. Now, if you had trouble noticing that I switched the slide, that's my whole point. It's actually very hard to tell from the true image over to the predicted image. Now, as I flip back and forth a little bit, you're probably gonna notice it's not perfect. You know, if you look over here on the right-hand side, the stains here are the blue are, are indicating the nuclei of the cells, and the green is a is a particular protein marker of depth. And there's a there's there's a, there's an image over here on the right that is uh, predicted to be dead, but is actually not. So it's we you know the model thinks it's a dead cell, but it's not. But you can see by and large it gets most of this correct. So let me give you another interesting example. So this is also looking at neurons, but these are human neurons. And I want to uh, draw your attention to this little funny looking feature here in the middle. This is completely an imaging artifact. This is not reflecting the actual biology of the actual cells under there. But, but just like the image before, you know, th this is the true and this is the predicted. And the model learns to deal with that imaging artifact without any special um, handling, without having to be told, oh, that's an artifact just because it's being told please you know from this image predict this image it's able to learn to ignore these kinds of things and this is a really powerful part of this technique that you do not have to go in and sort of deal very explicitly with all of these special cases and so um, this has been uh, you know, we developed this a few years ago and this kind of thing we're now starting to see uh, used across a number of places in cell biology to allow you to uh, see these kinds of images um, by just taking these much simpler to look uh, to, to take light field images. So let me give you an, let me give you another example. Um, and this one's gonna, gonna, gonna now we're gonna pop up to a much larger example about uh, about what we can see in the eyes. And so uh, the context for this is a disease called diabetic retinopathy. This is the fastest growing cause of pre preventable blindness. It's a uh, complication of diabetes. Something like a third of people with diabetes will develop this and something like a third of those people that develop it, um, it can be vision threatening. 
and because diabetes is on the rise worldwide, this is really a, uh, this is why it's such a it's such a growing problem. Now the good news is that diabetic neuropathy is relatively easy to detect. So these, this is imagery called fundus imagery. Many of you have actually probably had images like this taken when you've gone to the eye doctor. And this is you know, essentially taken by shining light in the eye and, and snapping a picture. And what, uh, what doctors can do by looking at this and by looking at some of the fine features of this image, they can they grade these images from a scale of no diabetic retinopathy to the most severe that really needs to be treated. And I'm sure you know, you know, all of you looking at this don't really know what they're looking for. But you know, if we go through it, you can, you know, you would be able to learn the types of things that that, that um, we're looking for. Now, the challenge is, of course, that there's an enormous number of people that need this screening. This is an example from a clinic in India where one of our team members were. Um, but it, it sort of and it's sort of indicative of this problem of there's just not enough trained doctors in the world to do the screening that needs to be done for this disease. And so we did what now seems like the very natural thing, which is to build a deep learning model to, to go from this fundus image over to these grades that the doctor um, that the doctors would give, as well as a few other uh, side predictions. And if you know much about the the deep learning field, this is not this this the the image model used is not particularly surprising. This is kind of a you know a standard well known uh, way to build these kinds of models. I think part of the real uh, magic of making this thing work is we spend a lot of time getting very high quality data. We hired a whole bunch of ophthalmologists to review images multiple times. We got lots of data. And like many things, you know, it's not the, just the quality of the model that you use, the quality of the data matters tremendously. And that's really why we're able to build a model which um, is better than the median ophthalmologist. So over here on the right-hand side, these are, um, um, rock curves which you may be familiar with but basically if the curve went straight up to 100 and then over like closer to the upper left is better and the algorithm shown in the dark line here um it's better than the, than the median ophthalmologist that you see all of these the, the various ophthalmologists you see here with these colored dots so this has been a great story and a number of other applications like this are coming out but there's something about this which i think is really interesting which we haven't talked about as, as much and this comes down to sort of a, a side project that somebody did. We had um, somebody joining the team and we wanted to give them a task to get started to learn how to build these models. And we had self-reported gender along with all, the, all of these um, images. We said, look, here's a great first task for you. You know, tr try to build a model that'll, that will predict gender. We really didn't think that this was, this was gonna work. It was just sort of the chance for someone to get familiar with the underlying, underlying tools and infrastructure. But to all of our surprise, they actually were able to build a very good model that predicted self-reported gender from this fundus image. And the 0.97 AUC here, this is a standard measure of classifier performance. And you know, just trust me in saying this is an extremely good classifier. And so what's really interesting to, about this to me is that this is a case where there was no known way to predict gender from the fundus. And so this is a chance for, you know, this really illustrates something that I think is exciting, not just to be able to systematize and do the things that uh, people can already get out of images, but to go and actually see something new. And one of the, and of course, the natural challenge then is how do we from this, um, you know, understand what's going on, what is being seen, and, and see if we can map that back to something human, human interpretable. And that really is an ongoing challenge with this. But once we had success with this, we tried to do all kinds of other things. This is showing trying to predict um, the uh, the age reported by patients, and you can see we end up with kind of you know a pretty decent classifier. It's you know maybe you know plus or minus five years, you know, a little bit of a skew over uh, skew over here. And so we used, you know this is you know this is also the type of thing where you you kind of know there's probably some differences. Our you know our skin and the vasculature all changes over time as we get older, but now we can actually map that to a real concrete. Uh, prediction here. We've also done for things like uh, blood pressure, where we didn't get uh, quite so good a model, but these are type things that you can sort of see might be causally related to you know what the vasculature looks like, but we don't have an a priori model about how to do it. And this is a direction for how we use machine learning in the context of both science and medicine in order to do, really do something that we weren't able to do before. And I think this, this kind of thing is a great illustration of this very exciting direction. 
So I want to now jump in, you know, you know, keep moving along here and jump into another topic. So here we're gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about uh, how sort of how we think about doing these kinds of uh, doing these kinds of uh, machine learning experiments for science. And the context here is in a disease called spinal muscular atrophy. Um, it essentially um, affects motor neurons in the way that they develop, leading to a, a loss of voluntary uh, movement. Uh, for people, and this can, uh, and this is a genetic disease, um, and there's several different variants of this disease based on exact the exact kind of genetic uh, perturbation that you have. And here, what's known is that this SMN gene is also something that's in fibroblasts, which are which are just skin cells. And so the question is, is there something we can learn about the disease by looking not at motor neurons, which are very hard to get, but looking at skin cells, which are very easy to get. And so the, what we did here was um, with a, a group at Harvard, um, we went through this process where they got skin cells from patients by sort of taking a punch out of the skin. Those cells are frozen and then uh, uh, grown, up in dish, uh, grown up in dishes. They're um, then uh, fixed so that we can image them well. We go through that staining process I was talking about early on. And you can get and you, with mo and with multiple stains, you can highlight different things that you'd, like you're seeing over, over here. And now the question is, what can we see in these images? And the most natural first thing to say is, well, let's just make sure that we can tell the difference between these SMA patients and, and, and healthy patients. That's the kind of first thing you would want to do. But the, you know, despite that being the real goal, that's not really the, the, the first thing you can do. You have a big data set like this, and here I'm sort of giving some of the numbers for how big this thing is. And it's not that many patients. You know, we only have 27 uh, distinct patients. But when you start saying, well, I've got these I got to take all these images per well. There's 60 wells per plate, 12 plates per batch. I do two separate batches. That means I sort of two different times. I I process uh, I process the um, the the cells. Um, this is, gets to be quite a bit of data. And so we're going to start off just saying, okay, can we separate the healthy and disease uh, patients here? And the first thing we ran into is that many of the images are blurry. And you can sort of see some of the images over here, and you can tell the difference between sort of this image down here in the lower right versus this one up here um, in the upper left. You can see we sort of lo really lose a lot of detail. But because we're gathering so many images, we really have to correct for this during acquisition, and we really have to have some way to detect that this is going on. And so the thing we did was to actually build a model to rate the quality of the images, the focus quality of the images we were getting. And I won't go into the, all the details about how this was done, but I think the really interesting part about this was is that we trained this on artificially blurred images. So we took in-focus images like this, we computationally defocused it, and then we and that allowed us to you know have a very very clear task to build a model on to uh, where we knew there was the only thing different between these images was the focus, and so we used that to build a model to predict what the focus quality was. And once we did that, we saw a lot of the very sad things. And so what you're seeing over here is the, the, the big rectangles here are, um, in, are basically the plates with all those little wells in it where we're growing up the cells. And the color here represents the focus quality where the yellow color here is better and the, um, and the dark, you know, sort of the dark red or black color represents a, a poor focus. And you can immediately see, first of all, there's quite a bit of variation across these different plates. And consistently we get these, you know, the edges are, are quite a bit worse. And what's important here is you really have to notice this in order, you know, you have to take the time to look for these kinds of problems. So what did we do here? Well, at the end of the day, we just had to do a better job taking our images. So we, we got better plates that were just flatter, so we didn't have this, um, we didn't have the same kinds of problems there. And we also did essentially the, this confocal imaging that allowed us to um, uh, take images at many depths so that we can actually, um, uh, uh, you know, even if the plate isn't completely flat, we can still have one of those planes that's really in focus with the cells. And so with that, you can now see that the, the images we got have a much better focus score and we're able to move on. But when we actually then said, great, let's actually look at models before we even try to predict, you know, which are, which, which are healthy and which are diseased, we looked at, you know, looked at one of these main big problems that comes up, especially in biological experiments of batch effects. And what I mean here is that we sort of processed a bunch of plates at two different times. Um, and, and, you know, those are, you know, that's batch zero and batch one. 
And I'm not going to go into the details of the model here, but it basically, you know, the, these points in space are kind of a low dimensional projection of what the model is seeing. And you can see what immediately falls out of this is that, you know, batch zero here in blue is just not like batch one. And this, you know, this unfortunately is just the reality of a lot of um, experiments that are done. And it really means you have to think very, very carefully about the way you design your experiment if you're gonna have these kinds of problems. But going further, we said, well, maybe it's not just batch. What about an, a bunch of other of these confounding effects? Like, can we predict which plate it's on? Can we predict which row the image came from? What column the image came from? And what we see is that we have some predictive power. The fact that the embeddings value over here is higher than this permuted, basically is representing that we have some predictive power to say that this, uh, that our model is able to tell there's something about it that is different per plate. There's something about it where we're different per row. And this should immediately, you know, you know, worry you a little bit about when I'm, you know, when I'm then looking at, a, at an effect, am I seeing something real or am I seeing, or am I seeing something that's from one of these confounding effects? So there's a lot of questions there, but then when we actually look at this task of predicting uh, healthy versus sick. These are again showing rock AUC values where one is really good. And we sort of did this many, many times by separating out all the different pairs of healthy versus uh, sick, healthy versus sick, healthy versus sick. And what you can see is that the model's not bad on most of the folds, except on this fold over here, it turns out that the model is exactly wrong. It's not just random, it actually predicts exactly the opposite. And here, you know what what we what, when we dug in this a little bit more we found out that the source of the cells was very well correlated with the what the function was these two sources a and b the two places that the, that the cells came from and you can see almost all the healthy cells and one of the disease cells came from one source and so it looks you know we have this unfortunate confounder that we've never been able to resolve of is the model just seeing something about the source of the of the lab and i think this is a really important um, you know philosophical idea that as we go to building models where we don't have the exact understanding of what's going on, the models are seeing things that we don't have a direct understanding of, you have to do these kinds of very, very careful uh, test and analysis to try to figure out whether the model is picking up on something that you really don't want it to be picking up on. And so I'm actually, you know, this, I think this, this work really represents a, a set of things that you have to do to really do these things well and to do the kind of good science with machine learning um, that, uh, that needs to be done. Okay, so I'm going to go, um, uh, I'm going to skip, that's what I just said, I'm going to skip to this next part and I'm going to talk about uh, a couple more projects here. In this one, we're now going to stay. We're going to stay in the kind of medical area, but we're going to talk about parasites. And in particular, we're going to talk about malaria. And so, malaria is, is you know is a still a huge disease in the world. There's something around half a million deaths per year. Um, and the graph over here on the left is the deaths per year, and you can see it's you know fortunately been going down quite a bit over time. And this is you know due through a lot of uh, a, a lot of efforts out there, and you know some of them is uh, like bed nets, other ones about good uh, good uh, mole drug molecules that are coming out. But the scary thing about it is is that um, resistance to our main uh, drugs are really starting to develop. And this and the graph over here on the right. You know, it shows you how prevalent resistant parasites are to the drugs that we currently use. And so this is, you know, we have a sort of lurking problem here about uh, uh, the, the drugs we are using are, are not going to be able to, to keep this positive trend going. And so what we, one of the things we need here is we need better assays. The current assays that people use are essentially a kind of a live dead screen. You know, you, you have the parasites, you uh, in, in red blood cells typically, you put molecules on them and you find out which ones kill the parasites. But what's really important is you actually need not just you know, you know, hit these hit molecules to start with, but you want them to be diverse and you want them to be diverse in the way that they work. And this is typically called mechanism of action. And so what we're looking for are how do we um, get hits with different mechanism of action? And you can't just see this in a live dead screen. And so the, the driving question for this research is, can we use these kind of high content screens with machine learning to allow us to find diverse hits and not just you know, identify the, on this live dead signal? 
And so this is a collaboration with our group in the bomb lab at Imperial College. And very much like the other um, examples I've showed you with cells, you know, there are cultures of these uh, red, of red blood cells with the parasites. They're put onto plates and they're imaged. And here I'm showing this kind of false color overlay of these different channels, highlighting different parts of it. And we, and from images like this, we are trying to uh, uh, learn something about the way the uh, parasite, uh, the way the drug is affecting the parasite. And so one interesting problem that comes up also comes up a lot in these kinds of areas is, you know, most of the Im most of the image is not very interesting. And what you actually have to do here is to find the parts of the image where there actually is a parasite, because all of this stuff up here in the over in the upper left, there's no parasite in these red blood cells. And so, you know, this is one of these kind of uh, uh, annoying tasks that has to be done early on to really focus on the things you want that you want to do. But if you don't do this well, your whole, you know, you're in trouble very, very quickly. And so what's important here about how we're going to detect these different mechanisms of action is the parasites go through a whole life cycle um, while they're in the blood. And so it's there's something like 40, uh, 48 hours, and they go through these, these sort of names, these name cycles like a merozoite, uh, like the troph stage and the schizont and the merozoite stage. And so you know these are kind of bin labels. These aren't really you know a completely distinct um, uh, stage of life. Just like saying you know a child and a tween and a teen, there's not really a you know a clean distinction between those. So this really is kind of a, a continuous life cycle that that we go through. And so what we did to try to you know, make sure that we could see more from these, from these parasites was to build an ML model to try to predict what stage of life they were in. And the basic idea here is to take all of these images, uh, go through another one of these deep learning classifier, and we just we take one that was trained on consumer images, and we sort of take that uh, top layer out. We, and this is usually uh, called extracting and embedding from these. So it's a way to map this image down to something that's like you know 100 odd dimensions. And so we take all these different stains. We take all each, the embedding for each of those stains. We concatenate them, them together. And then we use that as a kind of lower dimensional representation than all of these pixels up here. And so when we do this, and we then we ask uh, humans to look at these images and say, you know, is this a trope or a schizont, et cetera, what we see is kind of what you would expect, which is, you know, when as the um, I'm showing the kind of life cycle in a circle over here, the colors represent the uh, the the human labels for the um, for those images. And you can see as we sort of transition from one part of the life cycle to another, the human bin labels start to show some ambiguity. And that's really because there is some ambiguity, right? When a teenager becomes an adult is, you know, certainly somewhat of a, of a su subjective question, especially if all you had to do was to, to have a picture of them, it would be, you know, difficult to tell and there would be some disagreement. And that's the same thing we see here. And so, but from this, we can sort of get something which ends up being this continuous measure of life cycle. And so from those human labels, we train a model and the model is then able to map each of these images onto this life cycle. And so we see the whole, you know, again, the colors here represent the different stages of the life cycle. And now we can map each parasite onto the stage of the life cycle. Now, why do we want to do this? Well, remember, we're trying to find um, uh, drugs that operate differently. And one way to look at this is to say, well, does it affect the parasite at different stages of the life cycle? Does it affect the life cycle in some way? And so what you're seeing here is one of the examples of the results. And so the, the, this is a, just a big histogram where the x-axis here is the life cycle. The gray is a control. Basically, there's no drug there. It's just the, um, it's just the solvent that's used. And um, you can see there's a big uh, spike during the, at this ring stage. And now you can see the um, uh, atovaquone proquinol, which is the standard drug that, that's used here, that tends to sort of shift the distribution a little bit to the right, and there's fewer parasites. But that's very different than this uh, perspective molecule called KEA609, which seems to really uh, keep the, the parasite from going into this uh, schizont uh, stage and has a very and has a much different effect than, than this other drug. And this is exactly the kind of thing we're trying to find where we see these, these sorts of differences. Um, so lastly, um, I want to tell you about one other story. So I, I, I told you at the beginning, this is going to be about seeing and hearing more. But so far, it's all been about seeing. So let me tell you about the hearing part. So here, um, uh, the context here is a disease called ALS. 
um, sometimes called Lou Gehrig's disease. And I'm sure everybody has heard of this, even if they don't remember it, because you may remember the ice bucket challenge that came out a while ago. It sort of got lost in the mix in the end as this got so popular, but this started as a way to raise money for ALS research. And perhaps the most famous ALS patient is uh, Stephen Hawking, who also illustrates the, you know, the, 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 this disease where it's a law, it's a death of the neurons that control voluntary movement, and that, and that ends up affecting both speech and movement. And so we partnered with the ALS um, uh, TDI, uh, the ALS Therapy Development Institute, um, who's been working with patients and really supporting research into this disease and really doing uh, quite an amazing job for this. And so one of the things that they've been doing is to uh, gather voice and accelerometer da data from people with ALS. So I'm not going to talk about the accelerometer part today. I'm really going to going to focus on the voice. And here, you know, the the patients will say uh, particular sentences like "I owe you a yo-yo today," um, and they've gathered the and these they've gathered these recordings, which I'm representing as a waveform today. And based on those recordings, um, a therapist is able to listen to that and assign this thing called an FRS score. And the FRS score sort of represents um, how, um, uh, how understandable, how functional the person is in general. And so an expert might listen to something like this and assign a particular FRS score, say, okay, we'll, we'll assign that one a two, and you have a different waveform, and they'll assign that, and they'll assign that one a, a different score. Um, and so, um, uh, the 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 challenge is, you know, there are some of these things are fairly subtle. How do we go from these waveforms in order to detect these subtle changes to map it back to these FRS scores so that we can really understand something about how these patients are doing? And so the main idea here is that we're going to turn these back into images. So I told you it was going to be about hearing more, but really we're going to go back and use our same techniques that I've been talking a lot about, about how we can use machine learning to understand understand images. And so we take this waveform, we chop it up into lots of little pieces. For each of those, we build a spectrogram. This is this is, this is really just a Fourier transform that we're then representing as, as, an image, as an image here. We have a whole lot of these for all, the, all, for all the different segments of time, and we put all those together, and now the sound wave, sound wave is an image, and we can use a lot of our standard uh, machine learning techniques on these images. And so that's what we do. So we train a model to go from now this spectrogram image and say, okay, this spectrogram is an FRS score of two, this spectrogram is an FRS score of four. And so, that, and you know, unsurprisingly, you know, this basically works. And let me give you a couple of examples. Um, so one thing, important thing I wanna note here is that we split this by participant. Um, you know, thinking carefully about how you test your model is really important. So here we train on some participants and we test on some others. And by and large, the model is really good. So this is showing you the confusion matrix. This diagonal means the model got it exactly right. And you can see when the model gets it wrong, by, by and large, it's not making dramatic mistakes. It's doing most of the errors are kind of one score apart. And what this means um, is that, you know, we, you know, here is an example where the green or the true are the values reported by humans and the blue is what the uh, machine is thinking. And you can start to see, we start to see these sort of trends in behavior even before the, the, this kind of bend label of going from an FRS score of three to two um, goes down. And this is, I think this is actually really interesting because we, uh, you know, we believe we're starting to see finer grain distinctions than these coarse spinnings. And you can see the same sort of thing here for, you know, even before the official label sh shifts, we start to see a change as, uh, in, this, in these patients over time. And so I think this is a really interesting example of how we can use these techniques for understanding where patients are and helping us understand the effects um, during drug trials, which is one of the things going on right now. So, so a couple of fi final thoughts. A lot of these modern machine learning methods are really good at these kind of sensory tasks. And I think the kind of thing that where we can use these models to really you know, allow us to sense, to see new things in the world, is just a really, really promising thing to do. But there is a lot of risk in that. And we really do have to think carefully uh, as data scientists, why we should trust these, how we're going to evaluate, and, and how are we going to really build new understanding with those. So, of course, I've talked about uh, work here from a lot of different a lot of different people, and I want to thank all the scientists um, whose uh, work I was able to represent today, and I'd be happy to take some questions.
Great, thank you, Patrick. Um, from the audience, if there are any questions, uh, you may raise your hand and we could unmute you or you could simply type your question in the question section. We're also monitoring the chat window as well. So whatever works best for you. I believe the chat window is not open to the participants. I could be wrong. So Patrick, um, we have one question coming in mm -hmm. uh, from the questions window. So in the, the question is, in the last example, why didn't the model overfit and give more discrete predictions? Right, so the question is here, you know, I, I kind of like this idea that we're starting to, that we see some of this ambiguity here. Well, I think, I mean, I, you know, I suspect we could make the model overfit. Um, but you know, realize as you look across patients, you know, it might be that some raters of you know someone listening to the audio form might have flipped this one a little bit earlier, right? That I'm sure there's a little bit of human variation in this, for example. And so, you know, the model is, I think, you know, going to be reflecting that underlying uncertainty because effectively the label is a little bit random here. Now, we could I suspect again, I suspect we could have made the model overfit. Um, here on those particular examples, but I mean, I'm also showing results on the on the on the test data here. So, um, but this is you know, I think this is one of the important questions here is that you know, overfitting is a constant problem to to be worried. But um, uh, it is important that we spend our time and try to understand that. Awesome, thank you. Uh, the next question is, is there any applications for X-ray spectra and crystal structures? Um, so um, let's see, uh, I know that there, ha so we actually spent a little bit of time working with some of the folks from Slack trying on trying to do uh, for X-ray diffraction and trying to do crystal structure solving. And I know there's some other groups doing really good work there. We, you know, played with that idea a little bit, but didn't, uh, you know, didn't sort of, uh, you know, we didn't have a, have an output that we really uh, that we were really happy with. Um, as far as um, for not just X-ray diffraction, um, I'm trying to think if I know of other work like this, but it certainly seems like a very natural area to me. But I don't have anything at the top of my head that I can point you to. Okay, um, there is a question asked why do you have to transfer the wave files to images? Is it really necessary or do you last in, uh, any details during that translation? So I mean I, I actually I don't think it's necessary and you know there are um, people have built a lot of interesting models especially these kinds of um, recurrent uh, models you've heard you might have heard of things like LSTMs etc in order to take um, sequences like this. Um, this was the thing that um, we were able to do uh, very reasonably here. Um, I don't definitely don't think it's easy. It's the only way to do it. So, but we don't have to. But it was the thing that was effective. All right, wonderful. I think we have addressed um, all of the questions as of now. But uh, if you have any audience member have any questions to or follow up please feel free to reach out to us, uh, gds at aps.org. Um, and then let's uh, move on to the next presenter. Thank you, everybody. Um, thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Patrick. Yep, so the our next presenter is Dr. Rama Vasudevan. Um, he is an R&D staff scientist and data analytics coordinator at the Center for Nanophase Material Sciences, uh, short uh, with uh, uh, abbreviation uh, CNMS uh, at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. He completed his PhD in material science, specifically scanning probe microscopy of ferroelectric materials um, in 2013 from the University of New South Wales. His research has focused on marrying machine learning methods with principles of statistical physics to understand the microscopic 
mechanisms that govern materials phenomena. His current research interests including ferroelectrics, uh, scanning probe microscopy, and reinforcement learning for material synthesis applications. So welcome, Rama. And I see that you're already sharing your screen. Yeah, uh, thank you, Ji. Um, it's great to uh, be part of this webinar. Um, so first, you know, thank you for the organizers for organizing this, particularly in such case after um, the cancellation of APS. It's uh, it's really nice to see that there's a you know good attendance online, um, and so I hope you'll get something out of my talk. So uh, I don't know. Um, I hope you can see my when I my slides. Are they showing up? Um, yes, they are. Yeah. Okay. So uh, uh, I would first like to acknowledge, you know, the people that that did a lot of the work that I'm going to show today. Uh, in particular, um, a postdoc, Nick Bardino, who recently left and joined Siemens, um, who did some of the neural networks uh, analysis and work uh, in scanning probe that um, that I'll show you today, um, as well as my colleagues at CNMS. So Maxim Zietanov has done a lot, um, particularly very recently, on using Gaussian process models, uh, which I'll show, as well as my colleagues, Sergey Kalinin and Stephen Jesse, who have been kind of at the forefront of SPM development for the last 15 years. Um, but and many many other people and I'll try to acknowledge them as I go along. Um, so I'm from Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Um, it's in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and we're basically in, situated in this little building here, um, next to a larger facility, which is the Scalation Neutron Source. So you may know this is kind of the um, the premier neutron facility um, uh, in the United States. Um, um, and Rama, so you might want to maximize your slides. Oh, okay. Um, let's, let me. Is it maximized or not? It is not yet. Okay. Let's present with you. Interesting. It might be because you are using two monitors. No, I'm only using one. Um, What about now? Nothing is showing up on my side. Blank. Oh, perfect. Okay, I think you got it. Yeah, okay. So let me go back to this. Um, so yes, uh, yeah. So um, one thing that I want to emphasize here is that you know machine learning in, in material science and in microscopy goes back a long you know long ways. So people have been talking about how to marry machine learning with material science for more than twenty years. Um, you can go back, for example, uh, in two thousand and one uh, to an MRS Materials Research Society symposium proceedings. Um, where uh, people were talking about combinatorial and artificial intelligence methods uh, in material science. And so, you know, what, what do we make of this, right? So how come uh, material science and machine learning are kind of on the upswing again? And probably this is just a, a reflection of the fact that uh, research in machine learning has also kind of come in, come in waves. And so uh, because of the latest wave due to deep learning and, and um, uh, recent advances there, uh, it's not a surprise that other types of scientists in the physical sciences look at computer scientists and say, okay, look, it looks like they've made some advances. Maybe they could now be useful um, uh, to use them within our own particular areas. Uh, and so there's a long history of trying to incorporate machine learning within material science. Um, the, other thing, uh, the other thing that I would like to point out is basically that machine learning really thrives on the availability of labeled data sets, right? And one of the areas in material science which is really uh, fortunate is that we have very nice simulations codes for a very large variety of systems. So what this means is that uh, we can actually simulate a lot of data which is not generally possible in many, for example, healthcare kind of applications. Um, and so because we can simulate data in theory, uh, we actually have uh, the potential to generate some very nice large labeled data sets. 
Uh, of course, you can combine this with the available computational power in terms of GPUs, TPUs, and so forth. Um, and what you get is you get a, an ability to really improve the state of the art in many different areas. And so um, I hope that I can show you at least how we can improve it um, for scanning probe microscopy in this particular talk. Okay, so what is the missing piece here, right? So if this is so great, how come you know we're still a little bit behind, or at least uh, we're not uh, incorporating machine learning in every aspect um, of analysis within uh, within microscopy? Uh, and partly the reason for this is just you know the, the the missing piece is data, right? So we may have the codes, we may have the ability, we may have a theory, we may have um, some level of experiment. Uh, but we really need to create these kind of libraries or uh, data sets which are which have you know which are labeled um, which we can then use for machine for developing machine learning models so it's not enough just to have theory it's not enough just to have machine learning you really need to have uh, labeled experimental data uh, to go beyond and so you can read this uh, opinion piece that we wrote in MRS communications last year um, where we discuss this in detail but I think as people can contribute to some of these materials database libraries that are coming up, uh, we will be able to solve this problem in the, in the upcoming decade. So with that said, my talk is going to be about two, two particular uh, aspects. The first is going to be on Bayesian methods and active learning and how we can speed up spectroscopy um, using Bayesian methods. And the second one is going to be how we can really improve the state of the art in, in microscopy using neural networks um, as well as some statistical uh, techniques. Uh, and so um, I've kind of split it up this way. You can kind of think of the left part as kind of improving acquisition and, and the right part as kind of improving analysis. Um, so let's let's start with what scanning probe microscopy is, because not everyone here is familiar with what an atomic pulse mic microscope is or what a scanning probe microscope is. So basically you have a tip at the end of it. You have a tip at the end of a long uh, cantilever. Uh, and you have a laser that uh, bounces off the back of the back of the cantilever and on, onto a four quadrant photo detector. And uh, by measuring the laser position here using this four, uh, four quadrant photo detector, you can actually uh, determine what is the angle of flexion of this particular cantilever, and therefore what is the deflection of the particular of the tip. And so you can get some very nice um, information on what your cantilever is doing as you scan it across across the sample. Now, usually the way that we use atomic force microscopy is that we apply some kind of stimulus to this AFM tip, whether it be electrical, thermal, or mechanical. Um, and so we have uh, uh, tens of nanometers of resolution in terms of X and Y. Um, we can place these tips extremely precisely um, using piezos, uh, but we also have a tremendous Z resolution, right? So we have Z resolution on the order of tens um, or even one picometer. Um, uh, if you're careful about how you do your measurement. And so this allows us to study a huge variety of phenomena not limited to per electricity, um, ordering of, of, of oxygen vacancies, for example, charge injection, field effects, um, nanomechanics, and so forth. But the goal in any kind of SPM experiment is really to take the information that you get, which is basically your detector signal, um, do some processing on it, get some local spectra, and then uh, understand the local materials behavior. And then hopefully when you map that out, you at least to a global understanding of what's actually occurring in your particular system. Okay? However, uh, this is actually a non-trivial task. So I was actually you know, thinking about this one night before, before I was giving a talk um, as to how I can explain it in terms of uh, thinking of it from a computational point of view, right? So I'm an experimentalist, I go out and measure things in the microscope, but it turns out that, you know, one of the things that, I've, that I'm finding out is that experiments are particularly Bayesian in their approach. So what do I mean by that? So what I mean by that is, you know, when we do an experiment with, with, a, with, with SPM or with any technique for that matter, what we're probing is we're probing some kind of material parameter that we're interested in, okay? And this comes from some kind of distribution. Uh, for example, this, this material parameter might vary in space, right, in X and Y. Um, and so uh, to our experiment, we apply some kind of perturbation. Maybe it's a temperature, maybe it's a voltage, maybe it's pressure, and so forth. Uh, and so what we extract from our experiment is some kind of response function, right? So this response, in fact, is, you know, dependent on the perturbations that we apply, but it's also dependent on some microscope parameters. And at the end of the day, we end up with a measurement in a high-dimensional space 
but then what we are really interested in is not so much what this measurement is in this high dimensional space, but rather what it tells us about the material parameters themselves, right? So there are a lot of different steps here that we need to go back through and propagate back through in order to understand uh, what something important about the physics of our material system, okay? So with that in mind, you know, um, what I'm hoping to show you is that we can use some of the techniques that uh, computational scientists have offer us uh, in order to try and help us to go back to saying something about the material system, uh, which is somewhat different or somewhat better than the state of the art right now. So the first thing is kind of is, is active learning. So I don't know if if, uh, if many of you have heard of active learning, but basically, I can kind of kind of frame it this way. Let's say that I'm doing an experiment, and I'm going to it, the experiments generally will take you know five to ten hours. Well, maybe I don't need to uh, spend five to 10 hours. Maybe I only have a few, uh, three or four hours in order to conduct the experiment for various reasons. Can I then uh, adjust my experiment as it goes along such that I capture most of the available data that I require, right? Um, uh, in a statistically significant kind of sense. So you can think of it this way, right? So this is a figure that I got from a, a really uh, tremendous review on uh, Bayesian optimization by Nando de Freitas, who works at Google. Um, but basically, imagine that you have ex uh, a number of different uh, experiments um, uh, captured as, for example, along a particular line. So the, the black points represent the sampled, uh, sampled points, so they, those come from experiment. And what we are trying to do is that, is that we are trying to look for some signature in our experiment. So let's say that we are doing some kind of eels measurement. Maybe we're looking for um, a peak at a particular wave number, maybe at a particular energy loss. Maybe if we are in SPM, and we are looking at hysteresis loops, we're looking for a particular kind of signature in our hysteresis loop, like for example, the maximum area of our loop. But what we are trying to do is we are trying to maximize this particular line here, this blue line. So we have captured a few points in this space. And what we need to do is we need to find out what is the best point to sample next, okay? So if we can generate a function that kind of interpolates through our sampled points with a quantified uncertainty, then this can be quite useful because what it tells us, for example, is that you know when when I go out here uh, uh, in between uh, two particular points that have been sampled, obviously my uncertainty in what the function value is there is going to increase. However, the chance that uh, the the point is going to lie above this blue line is pretty small, right? However, uh, but if we look at these two particular points, we can see that the chance that there's there's a large uncertainty in between. The, the measure two points here. However, there is a good chance that if we measure it here, uh, in between these two these two points, that we will actually exceed our current blue threshold line. And so this this should actually be the point where you measure next. So you can actually use this approach, and you know the math has been uh, formally worked out um, over the past kind of three decades for Bayesian optimization, uh, which explains how we should perform our measurement under conditions of uncertainty. Uh, to maximize particular things that we are interested in, okay? And so we've done a little bit of work here. Um, these are two particular papers in NPT computational materials that have been published um, that, you, that I can refer you to. Uh, but the way that we we, uh, we make this work is we use Gaussian process regression. So this is a slide by Maxim, so I'd like to acknowledge him. But basically, uh, we need a function that, uh, uh, that can interpolate between our measurement points, right? So you could choose something like a quadratic or you know a, a spline function, for example, but they don't really give you quantified uncertainties and they really depend on the number of parameters that you choose in your particular model. Now Gaussian process regression allows us to avoid that because you basically find distributions over functions. It's kind of a generalization over distributions over parameters, whereas now what we're trying to do is find distributions over all possible functions. It turns out that this is actually uh, tractable so long as you provide a covariance. And so what that means is that we want to try to find all the possible functions that satisfy a particular covariance. Um, it's kind of given by this particular uh, uh, nasty equation here. Uh, the, important, the important part here is that we can actually solve this um, using modern GPUs and we can accelerate it um, using commercially available packages, um, for example, PyMT3 or, or, or Pyro and so forth. And so now we can uh, use Gaussian process regression in order to give us both the function itself as well as a quantified uncertainty, um, uh, which we can then use uh, for active learning. 
Okay, and so this is just an example. Let's say that I have uh, data like this. Um, it this actually comes from um, the function y equals sine of 10x with some noise on it. Um, we can oops, uh, we can apply Gaussian process regression, and you can see that you know with a periodic kernel choice, uh, you find a very nice uh, 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 interpolation function that's actually been um, uh, the mean of which has actually been shown. Okay. So we wanted to see if this could actually be useful for some of the kinds of data that we are exploring in, in scanning probe. And so this is again work by Maxim. So this is his slide. Um, but basically, uh, we often collect data which is uh, hyperspectral or 3D in nature. And so you can think of it here as we have an XY um, coordinate system as well as a frequency coordinate system. And so we collect this kind of 3D volume um, uh, uh, data set. What happens if we remove uh, 70% of, uh, of the data, and so we only have 30% of the observations, right? So if we randomly just to select 30% of the observations, we can then use our Gaussian process model in order to reconstruct what the full data cube would actually look like, right? And so you can see that actually, when you compare the, the reconstruction to the ground truth and you compute the absolute error, it's rather small. And so what this is telling us is that in fact, we are mostly oversampling our system. And this makes sense from a material science standpoint because you know, um, generally uh, there will be uh, uh, things like correlation lengths and, and a lot of things will be um, uh, uh, repeated uh, and, and we're probably oversampling both in terms of resolution as well. Um, so it, we can actually accelerate, at least this tells us in principle that we can accelerate our spectroscopy um, by capturing less of the data than we are currently doing. And this can be quite useful for situations where maybe uh, in SPM, it's, uh, you are concerned, for example, about the quality of your AFM tip over time. Uh, you might not be able to uh, use the same tip for 24 hours over an experiment because it might, you know, the coding wears down. If we can reduce that and, if, and, and try to get the same amount or almost the same uh, level quality of data in a fraction of the time, then that will be quite a substantial saving and enable new types of experimentation. Um, and you can see, you know, this is just to, to show what the ground truth is versus what the Gaussian process regression is, um, that it actually seems to match up very well. Um, uh, for the, the reconstruction seem to match up very well um, with what the raw data actually, actually says. So I looked at this and said, okay, well, maybe we can use this for spectroscopy. And so one of the kinds of re, uh, spectroscopies that we often perform at the Center for Nanophase Material Sciences is something called band excitation theater response uh, spectroscopy, which is a fancy way of basically saying that we take our AFM tip, we apply a voltage, and then we, we collect spectra. And the spectra basically looks something like this, right? So, so for a ferroelectric material, like lead titanate in this case, you will have um, a hysteresis loop. Um, and so you'll, uh, it'll be defined by two different polarization states, as well as uh, switching voltages. Uh, which basically define uh, the voltage you need to apply in order to reverse the, the electrical polarization state. Uh, we capture these uh, spec uh, spectra across a grid of points. In this case, it's a 50 by 50 grid. So there's 2,500 points, and each point uh, contains one of these spectra, right? Um, each measurement takes about, you know, a couple of seconds, and usually we measure about three or four hysteresis loops per, uh, per pixel, just for statistics. But um, as I showed you in the previous slide, most of this is actually quite heavily sampled, oversampled. So can we actually perform active learning uh, to dramatically reduce the acquisition time for this kind of experiment, which can often take you know, three to four hours? So uh, perhaps one way to try this is again, um, to adopt a similar approach. Let's say that uh, the first thing we do is we randomly sample 10% of the pixels, right? So that's shown here. So we take the 10% of the pixels here, and remember that each pixel is associated with an associated spectra. So this is actually a 3D volume. It's a sparse data set. Um, we perform some dimensionality reduction, and then we use this Gaussian process model to tell us um, uh, to predict uh, the unobserved pixels, and then use that uncertainty to guide us uh, as to what pixels we should be interrogating next in our experiment. So this is just showing you exactly how that, uh, how that, uh, how that ends up working. Um, so this here is kind of the predictions after a, a hundred new pixels are sampled. So if we start with 10% of our pixels sampled, which is 250 pixels, you know, uh, our predictions uh, seem to be relatively poor. You can see that in fact, um, 
the uh, images are quite blurry, and this is just because there's large uncertainty and uh, the, the choice of kernel uh, and the fact that we don't have enough information about, about our sample um, really means that uh, we're not extracting a lot of fine, stru fine structure features within our sample yet. However, after we have now interrogated another, let's say, 500, 600, up to 1,000 new pixels, um, we can really start to reconstruct what, this, what the full uh, 3D data volume looks like uh, in this particular case. And if you compare it to just kind of a random search, you can clearly see that you know, the, the, the GP approach and with active learning um, seems to outperform um, uh, random search. I should mention also, just as a caveat, that random search is actually relatively hard to, hard to beat in many cases, right? The only reason it works here, um, and the, the reason that GP works better is because we can actually take advantage of correlations that are present in our data set. Uh, and that's actually true for, for, for most, of, uh, most of our samples because they, they tend to have you know, uh, correlation lengths dictated by the physics of the system. Okay, so uh, that's kind of the first part. The second part is really about model selection. So one of the major advances I would say in the last 20 years is the, the computability of Bayesian models. And so this is really important because it allows us to make predictions um, over uh, with using several different models and trying to ascertain which model is more useful for our particular task at hand. And so because I'm an AFM person, um, I often deal with cantilevered style models. And uh, uh, typically what that means is that you, you know, similar to Patrick's talk previously where you get spectrograms, we also get spectrograms um, where we can, we take a complex response and we convert it to, um, you know, real and imaginary components or amplitude and phase components, which are shown here. Uh, and then we we run the spectra through a particular model. Usually we use the simple harmonic oscillator model, which is a linear model, and we can actually uh, fit this model to the spectra and extract uh, different parameters. In this case, we can extract four different parameters, including the amplitude of the response, um, the phase of the response, the quality factor, which is kind of the sharpness of this peak, if you will, uh, and the resonant frequency, which is the frequency at which you have this maximum response here. Uh, and this actually works pretty well. However, uh, we also know that um, in many cases, we drive our cantilevers with a relatively higher driving voltage. And uh, we know that the simple harmonic oscillator model is somewhat of an approximation, right? So we don't really have a fully linear oscillator in, most, in, in many cases. Um, there is some kind of nonlinearity uh, within this oscillator, and perhaps this, the simplest nonlinearity that you can add is the so-called duff duffing oscillator, where you add a cubic term to this equation. It's the same equation as here. However, now we have this uh, nonlinear term here, lambda u cubed, uh, which uh, makes the system a little bit more a little bit more difficult to solve. However, we did get uh, uh, some uh, solutions to the analytical solutions to this under. Uh, particular assumptions such as you know small uh, degrees of nonlinearity, and so again you can go ahead and fit your spectra and try to uh, recover parameters of this particular duffing oscillator. Uh, but now you end up with a with a with a question, right? I can fit the simple harmonic oscillator model, or I can fit the stuffing oscillator model. Which one should I choose? Like, should I always choose the the linear model, or should I always choose a nonlinear model? Um, which is suitable for, for which purpose, right? So that's a particular question about model selection, and it's one in which we can actually use the Bayesian approach um, to give us an answer. So what we do is we go ahead and we simulate some data, um, or we can actually just acquire some real data, which I'll show you in the next couple of slides. Um, and so uh, uh, under a Bayesian uh, approach, rather than just getting a simple uh, uh, estimate of the parameter, we actually get the full probability distributions of overall four parameters. So this is what the posterior is for those four parameters um, for the two particular models. Um, you can see that's pretty well behaved. Um, so now the question is, now we have these kinds of posteriors, uh, which model do we select? And there was um, a particular a criterion called the widely applicable Bayesian information criterion that was developed in the last five years. Um, uh, which allows us to actually answer this question. And it's actually computed like this, right? So I won't go through the math here, but basically you start with the log predicted density, you calculate some effective number of parameters, you then you, 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 compute the, uh, you compute this criterion, and then when you compare this criterion for the computed models, it gives you an, uh, kind of a weighting of which model to prefer for, um, for that particular data set, right? Um, and so when we go ahead and do this, it turns out that for almost all of our cases, uh, uh, at least in the experiment that we performed, 
uh, we should actually be choosing the nonlinear model over the linear model um, to analyze uh, our SVM data. Uh, and just to give you an example of how, you know, if you were actually trying to analyze this data manually, you would never be able to see this. Um, shown on the bottom left is some is real data, which is kind of red dots. Uh, the black line is the um, is the duffing oscillator model and the blue line is the simple harmonic oscillator model and so you see that they're actually extremely close in you know in all these instances however uh, apparently according to the widely applicable informa information criterion approach that the nonlinear oscillator model is preferred with more than 99 percent confidence in every single case so even though things may not be particularly evident by eye uh, because we have this kind of computational power and um, these tools that have been developed we can actually start to pull out some interesting nonlinearities that are present in our data, um, and then we can start to map them out. So here is the nonlinear term. Um, it's a reduced nonlinear term. And you can kind of see some kind of correlation with the domain structure. And if I actually plotted where the large nonlinearities are, uh, it seems to be correlated with uh, at least weakly with one side of a ferroelectric domain wall in this case. Um, we're still exploring the reasons for this. There can be multiple different reasons for why we observe this kind of nonlinearity. Um, but it just goes to show that when you analyze uh, data carefully and uh, use the, uh, the Bayesian approach, you can actually compare all of the all of the models that we have in our arsenal um, to be able to extract the maximum amount of information from our scanning probe experiments. Okay, so the second part of my talk, I'll kind of breeze through this relatively quickly. Um, it's going to be how we can improve uh, existing state-of-the-art uh, uh, scanning probe um, with deep learning um, as well as statistical learning approaches. So, you know, this was kind of work that was largely done by Nick, Nick Borodino. Uh, and so he was a postdoc at CNMS um, last, last year. And he came to me and, uh, and he wanted to know, uh, you know, can he get started with deep learning? So I said, okay, well, deep learning and deep neural networks are generally nothing but function approximators, okay? So, um, you know, we deal with these kinds of functions every day. Uh, in this case, again, we have the simple harmonic oscillator model. Um, how would a deep neural network perform in terms of extracting the parameters of this model given the data? Okay, so as I just showed you previously, we can solve this, right? So it has an analytical solution, and so it's a model with four parameters. And you might ask, why would you want to do it with a neural network which has potentially millions of millions of parameters versus a, a model which you can already parameterize which is four parameters? It doesn't make much sense. Uh, but it turns out that there's a really good reason. And the, the, the reason uh, is a little bit counterintuitive, but it turns, it's actually that deep neural networks are really good in high noise environments where traditional algorithms can start to fail. And we saw some of this, of course, in Patrick's talk, um, but I'd like, like to show you again how it works for a simple 1D case. Rama, we have. Yes. Uh, can we finish in three minutes? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Have... sure yeah, sure. okay, good. Thanks. Yes. So um, basically, uh, he went ahead and, and created a neural network, um, and because we can simulate the, uh, simulate data under very different conditions, uh, he, you know, this is the structure of the neural network. You, you apply a comp, you, you input a complex spectra, and out pops your four parameters of this simple harmonic oscillator model. Okay. And so this is just simulated data showing you that what happens when, um, uh, in this case, when you decrease the amplitude as you go down the image in the simulated data, this is the phase that you expect to reconstruct in the ideal case. If you just perform least square splitting, um, you can see that when you get to a particular value of noise, uh, the least square starts to fail. However, when you use the deep neural network, it's able to uh, maintain its performance for much longer, uh, for much lower values of signal to noise. And so this is really where the power of deep learning comes in, where what I think is, is happening is that uh, we can leverage the fact that we use convolutional layers as well as, you know, it's been trained um, on uh, millions of different samples, um, of, uh, many of them of, you know, in very high noisy environments, not to get trapped in this kind of deep, uh, local minima that least square seems to get trapped into and therefore, uh, when we use deep neural networks uh, in conjunction with least squares in terms of providing a prior for the least squares fit, we actually get um, uh, tre tremendously good uh, uh, solutions. And this actually allows us to image um, at order of magnitude lower excitations than we otherwise would. So just to quickly show you, this is a standard method um, at the lowest excitation, you can't see anything. But when you use this uh, deep neural network method, you can start to see even at the lowest excitations 
um, uh, contrast within the image. Okay, so I'm just going to uh, kind of uh, skip the last part because I'm a little bit out of time. Um, but so let's go here and just basically say, you know, the takeaway that I, that I'd like you all to get after from this is that, you know, in the words of Kanye West, we can make microscopy better, faster, and stronger uh, by using machine learning approaches. Um, uh, it really does provide you a toolkit to enable higher resolution, extract more information, you know, potentially allow for, you know, controlled and autonomous experimentation, um, as well as model selection. And if we can do this by infusing physical knowledge into machine learning models, I think we'll be much more successful um, at kind of uh, bridging the gap between uh, existing machine learning as well as existing physics and material science. Uh, with that said, I'd like to just remind you that I'm from the Center for Nanocast Material Sciences, which is a user facility. So if you'd like to use any of these techniques, um, please come and talk to me. It's a, a matter of a simple two-page user proposal. Um, so thank you so much for listening. This is wonderful. Thank you, Rama. Now we are open uh, for questions. If you have a question, please uh, either raise your hand or put it in the question. Uh, screen. Okay, I got one. Um, so the first question Rama um, asks that can the SPM probe randomly probe the sample efficiency uh, if efficiently and is it easy easily applicable to the data acquisition? Oh, that's a really great question. So in SPM, you know, we have tried, uh, yes, I mean, moving it uh, through to any XY is relatively straightforward. Um, uh, but we can also try other modalities such as you know, spiral scans, which we have done. Um, and so you can, you can basically program it to you know, however you, you wish. Um, at some point, uh, you know, there will be um, drift considerations. So uh, moving it extensively uh, over large areas and back again you know, without closed loop scanners will, will result in some kind of positional drift, which you may have to think about. But in most of our cases, um, that's not a, that's not really a big concern. Hey, um, next question thank you. from Wei Tang. Lee. Sorry, I yep. just unmuted. Uh, we had one person raising their hand. Wei Tang Lee, Are, you're unmuted. You can talk. Okay. Um, so what's the, I can see which uh, you didn't explain, but what's the difference between uh, using the deep neural network uh, and deep neural network plus the least square? Um, I, I do not understand the difference. Yeah, so um, what we're doing there is that uh, we are, the least squares requires a prior, right? So it requires a guess, basically. Um, and so the deep neural network provides that guess, and then the least squares optimizer takes over from there. Um, uh, oh, and so, so basically, what what's what's occurring is the the, the reason the least squares is failing is because it's getting trapped in some kind of local minima um, uh, in the cases where the noise is quite substantial. Um, and so, you know, we have we have our own methods to try to provide a better guess for least squares, which didn't involve neural networks. And what was interesting is that uh, the deep neural networks seem to outperform our own existing methodologies in every single case. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And the next question comes from Trevor David Rome. Let me try to unmute you. Trevor, you can talk. Oh, great, thank you. I was wondering if it's challenging to get enough training data to train your deep neural networks. Yeah, so it, it can be, um, but in this case, because you know uh, we have we have the model, uh, we can simulate as many as we like. So the uh, you know I think we ended up training this particular model on on millions and millions of curves because uh, it can be done in you know a couple of hours really. Um, but in in general, uh, it can be an issue where uh, if you are trying to improve performance and you need labeled data sets. Uh, you may not have access to all of the data that you need. Um, and, and that remains an ongoing issue. Thank you. Oh, 
with that, uh, I think we are at time and I really want to thank Rama for your wonderful talk. Thank you, Rama. Thank you, Jean. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Rama. It's fun. All right. Uh, this has been a very exciting day for me personally. Uh, computer vision is my research area and data science education is what I do every day. So uh, with that, I would like to introduce uh, Sarah Stone. Uh, Sarah is the executive director uh, of the University of Washington at eScience Institute. Uh, this is the hub for data science at uh, UW campus. She uh, also, uh, she co-leads the eScience education and also uh, career path uh, special interest group uh, with the departments to create a specialty master's degrees. Uh, I'm particularly interested about this talk because that's what we've been doing at uh, Boston University uh, in the past couple of years. Also, uh, Sarah uh, also directs the uh, UW Data Science uh, for Social Good, uh, which allows which uh, allows the students to work with uh, uh, different uh, you know uh, projects across the country with academia, government, and uh, private sector uh, to find data driven uh, solutions to uh, pressing uh, societal uh, challenges. Uh, so in this talk, Sarah will talk about the university-wide approach to uh, integrative data science education and career paths. Uh, with that, Sarah, I'll uh, pass it to you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, can you can everybody see my slides? Yes. Okay. Great. Um, well, thanks. It's a real pleasure um, to have the opportunity to speak today. And this talk is a little bit of a different um, nature than the last couple of talks. Um, but I'm delighted to have the opportunity to talk about um, our data science programs. Um, and I appreciate the, the work that the organizers have gone through um, to make this session happen under obviously challenging circumstances. Um, my talk today is really gonna focus on the approach that we have taken um, to create an integrative data science education program at the University of Washington. Um, and I'll also, of course, you can't create an education program without the people who are supporting that program. So I'm going to talk on um, and touch on um, also the data science career paths that we've created, both in the context of formal education curriculum and informal um, data science curriculum um, at the University of Washington. Um, and I'd like to also thank um, David Beck, who's our director um, of research at the eScience Institute um, and was also involved in creating this presentation. Um, so of course, it's not gonna be a surprise to anybody <laughs> in this session attending this talk um, that all areas of science, um, particularly the physical sciences, are experiencing a data revolution um, that is changing our approaches to discovery. Um, this data science transformation is being driven by factors such as advancements in high throughput instrumentation, um, more powerful models producing ever more data, uh, new modes of scalable computing, um, cost reductions also in storage and, comp and computation, um, and perhaps most importantly, and, and obviously um, a focus um, more recently, are breakthroughs in algorithms such as deep learning. Um, and so the eScience Institute is really formed around the understanding um, that this data revolution is really influencing all fields of study um, and all sectors of the economy and really every aspect of our daily lives. Um, so the original, so the eScience Institute has been around um, since 2008, and so that may, to some of you anyway, explain the origin of our name. Um, eScience was a term that was used more commonly um, you know, 10 years or so ago. It didn't really take off in the United States, but um, we have, have stuck with that name. Um, and it sort of uh, reflects um, that we had some very early thinkers on the University of Washington campus, um, notably our founding director, Ed Lazowska, um, who were thinking about um, the importance and sort of the, the, this oncoming data revolution um, and recognized that really the ability to extract knowledge um, from large heterogeneous um, data sets was really going to lie at the heart of 21st century discovery. Um, and so really to remain at the forefront, um, researchers in all fields um, would need access to state-of-the-art data science methodologies and tools. Um, and that these methodologies and tools, there would be kind of what's sometimes been called a virtuous cycle and that these methodologies and tools would then would need to advance rapidly 
um, driven by the requirements of discovery. And so there would be this positive feedback between the creation of new data science tools, their application in domain fields, the needs of domain fields increasing and changing over time and driving new discoveries um, or the development of new methodologies. And that we'd really reached a time period where we were no longer um, limited by computational power, but we were, data science was really driven and limited by the amount of intellectual infrastructure, or you could think of that as human capital, um, and um, the software in infrastructure, so this um, array of shared tools and services. Um, and so this was really a change um, in the thinking of, of the discovery process. And so the eScience Institute was really found or founded around these, this motivation. And I always like to just toss in here too, um, because I think we can often connote data science with sort of big data. Um, and I think it's important to remember that, you know, for, for many folks, these data science challenges um, don't emerge just at the massive data level. Um, so research, researchers struggle with organizing, managing, analyzing, querying data in the gigabyte range um, because data sets can be very complex, messy, heterogeneous, um, and or arrive at high velocity, um, by especially as we in increase our instrumentation capacity. Um, and so I think at the eScience Institute, we really recognize the importance of engaging with that full data science workflow. Um, and supporting students and researchers at every stage of that process. And I think that's something we think about also in the context of creating these educational programs. So then our mission, again, I'm gonna just uh, giving some framing for our institute because I think the framing of the institute really helped to drive the way our education programs were developed on campus. Um, so then coming to our mission, so our mission really is to empower researchers and students in all fields um, to answer fundamental questions through the use of large, complex, and noisy data. Um, and um, so we have a variety of programs. I'm not going to go into actually most of them today, but I'd be happy to talk about those in other contexts um, uh, or feel free to reach out to me about those. Um, today, I'm, as I said, I'm going to be focusing on the, the educational pieces um, and on, to some extent on career paths. Um, but I think that does play into this idea that um, part of what we've done in creating these programs is also to become a hub and a resource on our campus um, for data intensive discovery. Um, and, and that's led to, I'll, I'll touch on some of those programs briefly um, that have built up that community. Um, so if we look kind of broadly at all the things we do, this is a lot of things. I'm not going to go into all these things. Don't get scared. Um, but I am going to be focusing in on this part about education. And I did want to draw the distinction between kind of formal education um, and the development of the data science curriculum, as well as informal education. I'm going to spend the bulk of the talk on the formal education um, because that, I think, was more the interest in this session. But I do want to touch on some of our informal data science education programs. Um, I also want to note here that I think um, we were able or we've been able to have a lot of the successes that we've had on our campus um, because um, the, the changes and the programs that were instigated were done via eScience as an institute. And the eScience Institute is, is a, a neutral player on campus in the sense that we're not a department. Um, so we don't necessarily benefit from the programs that I'm going to be describing today. And so we were able as a neutral player, as sometimes people say this sort of as a Switzerland, um, to convene an interdisciplinary data science education working group that brought together faculty from about 15 different departments. Um, and, you know, I think that can be hard to do when you're seen as coming from a particular department. I think if we had tried to do this, you know, if it, from a, the, the computer science department, for instance, or another methodology department, um, it can be, get, get, be harder to get that kind of buy-in across departments. I, can, I, I can't see you nodding your heads because we're on webinar, but I know we've all experienced that kind of siloing that can happen on university campuses. So if we look in terms of this education working group, it was really focused on an integrative approach. Um, and again, this reflects our mission of really seeing data science as being integrated in all disciplines. And so the overarching goals of the um, data science education working group and, and what we hope to, to create on the UW campus, the first goal was really to educate all UW students in data science. Um, I don't think we've gotten to that goal yet, but I'll talk, tell you about how we're approaching that goal. Um, and this was under the recognition that many students need to learn how to use data science tools. And there's some 
of those who need to learn how to build data science tools, and that perhaps education pathways should be different between those two groups. Um, and that, that you'll see that um, structure reflected um, when I go into the details of our program. Um, and I, you, you might argue, um, well, I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, the second goal is that um, we really thought it was important that data science be integrated into existing departments and units on campus. Um, and there's a number of reasons for this, but I, I think um, dominantly because we didn't see data science um, as a separate um, discipline, division, school, um, department, um, and we wanted all the departments, again, we see data science as being integrated into the departments um, and being important for all fields. Um, and so you'll see that the design of our education program is really such that the departments, each of the departments can own data science for their department. Um, and that hopefully then um, students that graduate from those departments, they are getting the data science skills and the data science courses that are most appropriate to their discipline. We can't expect everybody on campus to be in, become an expert in every aspect of data science, particularly if they're coming up through a department um, like um, oceanography. Um, and so this idea is that the students are coming out with the skills that are most appropriate for their field. Um, and then lastly, and this, this gets back to the, an earlier point, so we are also interested in creating an interdisciplinary community of data science recognizing um, that interdisciplinary conversations that are focused around methodological challenges are a very rich space. Um, for example, I, we've even seen in you know, just the talks today um, that we can come together around methodological challenges. For example, we can come together around challenges we might have with processing images because there's people processing images across many different types of research. Um, and so there's this interesting cross-disciplinary area where we can come together on these methodological challenges. And so fostering that community for students, um, for research staff, and for faculty to come together and have those conversations has been really important to us. Um, so the, the this sort of overarching framework um, for our education um, curriculum has been based on data science options. Um, and the idea with the data science options um, is that um, these are what's called transcriptable options. Um, so essentially the data science working group um, put together a framework for the critical components of a data science education that should be part of an option then a department can offer that data science option added onto their own degree. So for example, and I use the example of oceanography because I'm an oceanographer in, in training, um, a, a student, a graduate student might get a PhD in oceanography um, with an advanced data science option, and that would appear on their transcript. Um, and there would be a series of courses that I'll go into that they would take to fulfill that option. Um, some of the benefits that we see of the data science option is that, again, this sits at the departmental level. Um, the faculty vote on that option. They own that option. Instead of feeling like they might be losing students to another data science department or um, degree on campus, that's the training that their students are getting, and it might actually even help them. We've heard from departments can actually help them to attract students who are really looking for that data science training. Um, the process is then that, you know, depending on all, we have graduate and undergraduate options, that goes through kind of a standard review process on campus. And eScience Institute plays a neutral role of um, affirming that the um, proposed departmental option fits the framework required elements. Sorry, it's not letting me. Oh, OK. Sorry, wasn't letting me advance there for a minute. Okay, here we go. Um, so let me go through the data science options. Um, I'm gonna start with the graduate data science options. Those were the first that we developed. Um, and the advanced grad graduate data science option is sort of the highest level um, option um, that we have. And this going back to an earlier slide, so this is really for, for students who wanna become tool builders. Um, and so, in the case of the advanced graduate data science option, um, students need to take three out of four courses in the, the um, methods areas that you see listed here. Um, so this includes statistics, machine learning, data management, and data visualization. 
Um, for the advanced graduate data science option, these are all the highest level courses in these areas. Um, and there's no flexibility on which courses the students take. I mean, beyond that, you know, there's a little flexibility listed there, but the, they can't, departments can't sub in other classes. Um, and obviously, since these are the highest level classes, there's a lot of prerequisites involved in getting into these classes. Um, students in the data science option um, also participate in an interdisciplinary graduate data science community seminar. Um, and in some cases, departments can opt to have additional extra requirements, um, again, fitting their particular degree needs. Um, at this point, the gradu advanced graduate data science option is offered in 12 different departments on campus. Okay. Um, at the graduate level, we have a second option, which is the standard graduate data science option. Um, and this is really designed for tool users. And you'll see as I walk through this, that it's a much more flexible approach in terms of the courses, um, the so sort of categories of courses that are required. Um, and I would say, you know, this is the um, option that has especially more recently, become much more popular and is becoming pervasive across um, particularly STEM disciplines. Um, so the idea here is that students need to take three out of four courses in the methods um, areas listed below. Um, in this case, there's a software development for data science, and we've actually created a number of different courses that are really designed um, to do um, to teach software engineering to non-CS non students, um, and particularly students that may be coming from fields like biology um, or some of the engineering disciplines. Um, then um, there needs to be a course in statistics um, or machine learning, data management or visualization, um, and then they can also do a department-specific course. I should also note that any of these categories can be filled by um, existing courses in the department. Um, for courses like statistics and machine learning, um, those are you know, typically students are going outside, they're going to statistics or computer science. But in many cases, um, for example, if I go back to oceanography again, um, uh, you know, an oceanography student might take um, an ocean modeling course to fulfill the data visualization requirement. So there's a lot of flexibility, again, for departments to find the right courses for their students. Um, and these courses have fewer prerequisites um, than some of the other courses that we talked about in the advanced option. Um, and um, yeah, at this point we have 10 departments um, with several more in progress um, putting together this um, the standard graduate data science option. I should also note that many departments have both the advanced and standard option. There's no reason not to do that. And in our experience, typically if a department has both, there's fewer students who do the advanced, um, more students do the standard option, um, but that allows the students to have some flexibility as well. Um, just taking a look at, at some of who these students are and, and what the community is that we've built around this, um, I wanted to note that actually the advanced data science option arose out of um, an NSF IGERT award um, in 2013 um, for data science. Um, and that helped to build out the structure for the first advanced data science option and really gave us the, um, uh, the framework to then move into the standard option and as I'll show you into an undergraduate option. Um, we've also been fortunate in terms of creating this community with the graduate students um, in the context of a uh, program that we've been a part of called the Moore Sloan Data Science Environment um, to bring in postdoctoral fellows. Um, what's interesting about both the postdoctoral fellows and these IGERT students is they were dual mentored. So in all cases, they had two um, supervisors, one in the methods, one in a methods discipline and one from a domain field. The, the primary depended on the field of study um, and the, the, the thesis work or the um, research work um, of the student or the postdoc. Um, and this broad interdisciplinary community, I know you probably can't see all the different disciplines that are represented here, feed into the various community building activities that we do for these groups. Um, moving on to the undergraduate students. So we took that same approach of this data science option um, for undergraduates. Um, so this is similar again to the to the PhD option. It's on the transcript. The student is still getting a degree in their primary discipline, um, but that option is noted on their transcript. Um, in the case of the undergraduate option um, framework, 
Um, there's flexibility in terms of the classes that are pointed to for every one of these requirements. Um, again, you see a lot of the same components, programming, machine learning, um, privacy, security, ethics, and society. Um, and there's a number of courses that were created um, to fit into that category, as well as some that already existed on campus. Um, and then two out of three in data management, data viz, and communication, um, statistics and probabilities. And then again, there's this optional department-specific courses. Um, at this point, this is offered in six departments on campus. Um, I would certainly note that almost, almost all of those departments, so five of the six are what we would consider sort of methods disciplines. Um, so these are departments like CS, um, stats, um, applied math, um, the information school. Um, what's been apparent over time is that it's very hard for departments outside of those methods fields that already had a lot of these components in their curriculum to add a data science option. Um, just because of how impacted undergraduate curriculum is. Um, so what we've tried to do is, is create a number of courses that are available um, to students without any prerequisites so that they can get some experience with data science um, without necessarily getting the option if that's not offered in their department. Um, so these include courses like Data and Society, um, Introduction to Data Science, and an Introduction to Programming in Python. Um, and these are offered, Introduction to Data Science is offered every quarter and it rotates between being offered through different um, programs or different departments on campus. Um, we've also actually now are in the process of developing a data science minor um, because it became clear that even these introductory courses that we developed um, for pre-majors weren't very accessible to students coming from the social sciences, arts, and humanities. And so the data science minor is really focused on creating tracks and courses for students coming from outside STEM disciplines to access data science um, methods and um, training. So just looking at an overview here, this gives you some of the timing. Again, we, we started at the top with the advanced data science option, and we've been sort of um, working our way into the undergraduate option. I'll quickly note here, but not um, provide a lot of detail. Happy to, again, provide that. Um, outside of, um, of this presentation, but there's also a professional master's um, at the University of Washington, and that came together by a merging of six different departments to create the framework for that professional master's. Um, of course, as I mentioned, you can't have all these new programs and all these new courses without, of course, having the faculty to support it. Um, we're really fortunate at the eScience Institute. We have over 100 affiliated faculty. Again, we're not a department, so faculty are affiliated with us, but that we are not a home for them. Um, and these represent over 40 different um, uh, units or departments on campus. Um, one of the things that was really helpful um, about five years ago um, is that um, the provost supported half faculty lines to accelerate recruiting um, of pie-shaped faculty. Um, I don't know if you all have heard this term, um, this idea of, of, of being pie-shaped. Um, let's see, I don't know if you can see my cursor here, um, but the idea is that um, of somebody being pie-shaped is that um, we all in sort of in a standard liberal arts education, we tend to be um, uh, have knowledgeable in a broad range of areas, and then we usually choose some area to become deep in. And so we might be, most people might be sort of T-shaped, I guess you'd say. Um, and the idea with being pie-shaped is that an individual or researcher isn't just deep in one area, they're deep in a domain application field as well as in um, the development of methods um, for that field. Um, we've actually had a number of conversations around this where people feel like, well, um, <laughs> it might be, might be hard to um, get everybody to, to necessarily end up as pie-shaped, but, but there's this idea of, of that. And, um, you know, you may end, up, may end up somewhere closer to Lambda. Um, and so this, um, these half faculty lines from the UW Provost were really helpful in recruiting um, faculty who might not otherwise have been considered core um, types of researchers in their field. Um, so they would have been considered to maybe be spending too much time on developing methodologies for that field and not enough time on basic research. Uh, maybe they were developing software and that reduced the amount of publications they might have in the primary journals of their field. Um, so these half faculty lines um, allowed to bring in some of those individuals. Um, and so these recruits were then expected to develop new methodologies and disseminate those methods through teaching, consulting, and collaborative research. Um, 
Because we wanted to make sure that their advancement wasn't inhibited by spending more time on methods development, eScience participates in their annual reviews um, and makes sure that these alternate metrics for advancement are valued. Um, this has really had a ripple effect across departments and really across different colleges um, on our campus. And now we find that um, new faculty recruits are, we often are called on to meet with new faculty recruits because having an institute like eScience is seen as a valuable way to draw in these kind of faculty. Um, and the faculty that were brought in through this initiative have been so successful um, that many of them have we had to be involved with retention offers and other types of activities because they've been hugely successful. Many of them now run centers um, uh, with various doing various types of data science related activities on campus. Moving on now. Um, I wanted to, as I said at the, the top, I wanted to spend a little time just talking about informal um, data science education and training. Um, and I think, I, you know, what I want to emphasize here is, um, you know, we're not, we're not all in a position where we can take advantage, um, just checking my time here, we're not all in a position where we can take advantage of, you know, stepping into um, a, a curriculum um, as graduate students or undergraduates, but there's many folks on campus who can really benefit from picking up um, data science um, skill sets. And so having um, opportunities for training and education that sit outside the formal curriculum um, has been extremely valuable. Um, and so I'd like to talk about some of those. I would say they sort of can help to fill the gaps between um, the offerings that are available on campus. Even for, I um, mean, if we think about graduate students um, who may not be working with an advisor that's um, supportive of them spending a lot of time doing coursework in data science, um, we can provide offerings that allow um, students to um, start to pick up some new skills. Um, so some of the things that we do through the eScience Institute include um, just open drop-in office hours with data scientists. Um, and our data scientists, I'll show you what, you know, who these folks are in a, in a minute, but they represent many different fields of study in terms of their domain expertise and also in terms of the methodological um, uh, areas of expertise that they bring. Um, I've mentioned already that we do a number of different seminar series. Um, we uh, host special interest groups on topics, so I think actually it was mentioned that, that the um, Opening, so I co-chair the Data Science Education and Careers Special Interest Group. That's kind of a meta-level group. We also have more topically focused groups on things like text as data or satellite image analysis. Again, noting that, you know, again, if we think about satellite image analysis, there's researchers all across campus that use satellite image analysis for very different types of um, research applications, but they often have similar challenges. Um, we also host a number of tutorials, boot camps, and workshops. Um, we've had a partnership with an organization called The Carpentries um, for over the past five years, during which time we've trained over a thousand students in introductory programming in Python and R. Um, if you're not familiar with The Carpentries, there's, they're a wonderful educational resource um, that provides some really well-honed kind of two-day trainings um, for intro programming. Um, we also do a lot of work on helping researchers um, move into the cloud. Um, we've developed um, five different hack weeks that are um, disciplinary, one to two week long um, events where um, researchers come from around the world to work together um, on hacking on particular research projects, as well as um, doing um, training on tools, new tools um, for application to their discipline. Um, we also do um, kind of quarter-long research incubator programs. So all these things sit outside that formal curricular space but provide an, an, an important opportunity for researchers on our campus um, and so, for students uh, on the campus. Yeah. We have about three minutes left. Okay, I'm, I'm almost done. I think I'm close to my Great. last slide. So I wanted to say, again, getting back to careers and people, we can't do all that informal curriculum without having the support. Um, and so we are extremely fortunate to have a team um, of data and research scientists um, at the eScience Institute. And so I've put up their pictures here um, uh, in part to just show that, uh, again, I get, you actually probably can see it, unlike when we're on <laughs> in big auditoriums. Um, you can see they come from a variety of different fields. Most of these folks got really interested in developing data science tools and tools um, because they were up against a challenge in their research. Um, and then they got so excited about developing those tools that became a dominant part of what they do. Um, they all readily work um, across different um, disciplinary areas. 
um, and they all have expertise in one or more areas related to data science. Um, one of the, the key features of these positions is that they have sort of a 50-50 split. They continue to do independent research um, and then they spend about 50% time doing service to the Institute, so participating in the various programs I mentioned before. Um, this is not at all in the model of kind of a programmer for hire. We don't take pro projects thrown over the fence to these, to these individuals. Um, it's really about working shoulder to shoulder and the model of sort of teaching somebody to fish. Um, this is another way that we've tried to um, create a positive um, relationship with different departments on campus um, and help um, increase training capacity. Um, and many of these folks have been over time, we've, we've been very fortunate to retain a lot of the group that I just showed you have been with us for five years or more, which is pretty amazing in the Seattle area for people who have data science skills to keep them in academia. Um, and many of them have been very successful at, at generating external grant support. Um, so again, I didn't, I've, I've touched on a, a very small fraction of what the eScience Institute does. I'd be happy to, to talk more, to answer questions about other areas. Um, but it's been a pleasure to share this with you today and I thank you for the opportunity. Wonderful, thank you very much. Um, let's see, we get questions. We have, William, I think this is your question. Did you wanna uh, speak up or do you want me to read it? Um, sure. Um, thanks, um, Sarah, for a good talk. I was going to ask you just to talk a little bit about the difference between the software carpentry um, courses and your um, intro um, course, you know, your sort of, uh, what was it, data, uh, software development for data science and how these compare to each other. Yeah, so the um, software carpentry is just a two-day course um, and or sometimes it's taught as four half days. Um, it tends, it, it covers, so it, there's a Python version and an R version of kind of the standard software carpentry um, course. And so um, it would cover sort of intro programming in either Python or R. Um, it does an intro to Git. Um, it actually, for, you know, some of the folks who take this have never worked at the command line. So it, it sort of goes into some of sort of the basics of, of working in a command line. Um, and versus the, the, um, Courses like the um, Intro to Data Science are, you know, these are four full quarter long courses. Um, and so they have the opportunity to go into um, those kinds of topics in a lot more depth. Um, does that get to your question? Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, I would say that the nice thing about the carpentry is it's a way to, to very quickly um, give um, you know researchers students um, you know some new skills um, and you know it can often help them kind of dip their toe in the water so to speak great uh, next question is from Trevor David Rohn uh, he's asking if uh, you guys invite people from outside uh, Washington University to participate in your program um, well, we do invite outside speakers if you're interested in coming and giving a seminar. Um, so we have a, a UW Data Science Seminar speak series um, that brings outside speakers. Um, we're also interested in exploring the idea of having people come and do sabbaticals with us at the eScience Institute. Um, so I don't know if, if that's quite what you had in mind. And then, you know, any of the programs, uh, I'm, let's see, I'm challenged to think of any of the sort of informal education programs that aren't open um, broadly. Um, so all the hack weeks um, that we run, um, those are open to individuals. We have people come from around the world to attend those. Um, the Data Science for Social Good program, um, we take proposals um, from across the country and we take student fellows from across the country. Um, so a lot of these are open. If you're wondering about a particular program, I'm happy to, um, you know, talk about that program or if you want to contact me offline. Great. Uh, next question from Joshua um, is asking if you can speak to any resistance uh, that you might have encountered with traditional faculty uh, who may not see the point of basically integrating data science into curriculum. Uh, I would like to add to this uh, if you could speak if you have had any sort of uh, interactions with the physics department uh, particularly uh, regarding this kind of uh, potential resistances. Well, I will confess that when I said that we have this, um, these options in 18 different departments, physics is not one of those departments. Um, 
and I have talked to them about this, and I think there is an, an um, perhaps quite justified feeling that this is already in the curriculum. Um, and um, so, uh, you know, that's something we do hear from some departments. Well, we're already doing this. Um, I think what can be gained by, you know, to some extent by the options anyways, is, is that there's an opportunity to take courses that are outside of the department. So while a lot of these courses may be offered by a department like physics, um, the, there's some courses um, that have been developed um, in other departments that the students really want to get access to. Um, and um, so I think there's there's that piece that also the there's a real value in the students being part of this interdisciplinary community where they see how other students and other disciplines are tackling problems um, and they just don't get that within their their own discipline that's harder to convince faculty of I think often um, let's see but so I, I definitely have encountered resistance and it's usually along the lines of oh, our students are already doing this but I would encourage those faculty to go talk to your students and ask them for what they want because we hear from students students reach out to us um, saying gosh can we get this option in our department like that I really want to have these skills this is what I'm hearing is needed in the, the job market and um, you know my department doesn't offer this so I think it's it, you know there's a selling point to departments to, to keeping to attracting students especially if you're having trouble attracting students um, to adding this this option even if you already have courses that are similar to this call it a call it a something you know like what we've done here is this idea that the, the departments can still own it and that's attractive to a department because they're not losing their students yeah unfortunately I think that's a trend uh, we see across physics departments and uh, hopefully it will change but uh, at least for now, we wanted to uh, maybe fill some of the gap uh, that's there as at uh, GDS. All right, uh, the ne uh, next question. We have two more questions. Maybe we can get to these. Uh, we are out of time, but this is the last uh, last talk. If you have a couple more minutes, Sarah. Uh, sure, I'm ready. Yeah. You, great. Uh, do you have online courses uh, on the software development uh, piece that you talked about? Um. So there are some, I mean, we've contributed online courses to part of the, you know, some of the Coursera suite. Um, not for the particular courses that I talked about there are not online um, versions of those, but the curriculum for those um, is available online. Again, you can, um, if you want to ping me, I can point you to the curriculum, um, but it's not available sort of um, through a virtual learning experience. Okay, so this was from uh, Sudipta. Maybe Sudipta, you can uh, contact Sarah directly. And the last question uh, from Alexis Knob. Uh, she's asking if uh, have you conducted studies uh, that include student feedback? Um, well, we get from the the courses that students are taking. You know, of course, students do the course evaluations, um, and so those are going to the departments, and those are used in tailoring the the courses, like you know, like it would normally be used. Um, for all of the activities that, that we run sort of more in that informal education suite, we do surveys of the students to understand, um, you know, where we're hitting the right notes and what things are missing. So yes, we do. Does that answer right. the question? <laughs> yeah, I think that's, uh, that's good enough. Uh, I assume maybe uh, also, you know, if, there were online options. There is certainly a lot more feedback that could be gathered based on the student interaction with the course material, uh, questions, quizzes, uh, things like that. Yeah. Um, great. Thank you so very much. Uh, I want to thank you and uh, uh, Rama as well as Patrick for accepting our invitation to join this webinar, uh, our first webinar series. We are going to continue. Uh, to have in the next several weeks. Uh, we are going to cover all of the invited talks and focus talks and as well as tutorials and short course uh, that we were supposed to sponsor. Uh, prior, after that, uh, we would hope to uh, basically have monthly webinars and continue this uh, uh, moving forward. All right, thanks everyone for staying uh, these two hours uh, you will hear back from us uh, for the next week and uh, also a recording of this uh, webinar thank you have a great day